Hey guys, it's Medicosis Perfect Snatus where medicine makes perfect sense. Let's continue our labs playlist. In previous videos, we talked about serum chloride and urine chloride. We talked about serum uric acid and urine uric acid. We talked about urine osmolality and the urine osmolar gap, as well as urine catecholamine. And in the last video, we talked about potassium in the serum. Today, let's talk about potassium in the urine. What was the normal potassium in the serum? The concentration was between 3.5 and 5 milli equivalents per liter. How about the concentration of potassium in the urine? Between 25 and 100 milli equivalents per liter per day. Now, let's get started. Please watch the videos in this playlist in order. First, the sodium potassium pump. Where do we find it? In every cell in your body. Here's the cell. Sodium potassium pump pumps three sodium ions to the outside and two potassium ions to the inside. And that's why normally potassium is more prevalent inside the cell than outside. A pump can have many consequences. A sodium potassium pump will pump sodium outside, potassium inside. That's why sodium is more abundant in the ECF outside the cell while well, potassium is more abundant in the intracellular fluid inside the cell. And since the pump is pumping three sodiums outside and two potassiums inside, the net is one positive to the outside, which is the same way of saying one negative to the inside. And that's why your resting membrane potential is negative inside the cell called your neuron. Moreover, we can utilize this primary sodium potassium ATPase and use that energy for a secondary sodium calcium exchanger like the one you find in your heart. Potassium is the main positive ion inside the cell. Outside the cell, its concentration is between 3.5 and 5 milli equivalents per liter. Why do you need potassium? Potassium is very important for the resting membrane potential and for repolarization or hyperpolarization. So it's important for cell function, heart rhythm, and neuromuscular transmission because all about the potential of the neuron or of the excitable tissue. So it has to do with excitability big time. And that's why if you have watched my previous videos on sodium, I've told you that sodium problems equals CNS problem, while calcium problems will give me cardiac issues. Potassium is all about the potential. That's why whether I develop hypokalemia or hyperkalemia, all of these can lead to cardiac issues, arrhythmias. Do you remember the story of insulin? Yeah, insulin pushes five guys into the cell. And these include glucose, of course, amino acids, and free fatty acid. It also pushes potassium and phosphate into the cell. And this is very important. Let's say that I lack insulin. Do you know what's going to happen? Potassium will not enter the cell. Potassium will stay outside, causing hyperkalemia. Let's do the opposite. Let's have too much insulin, maybe because I have an insulinoma. All of that potassium will be pushed inside the cell, leading to less potassium in the blood, i.e., hypokalemia. So giving the patient insulin can lead to hypokalemia. Lack of insulin, as in type 1 diabetes, can lead to hyperkalemia. Another important point is the point of acidosis or acidemia. Here is my lovely blood, which is having acidosis, too many protons. In order to buffer these protons, you can switch some of them into the cell. To maintain electroneutrality, if a positive enters the cell, another positive has to leave. This positive has to be the most abundant positive in the cell, potassium. Hydrogen comes in, potassium leaves the cell and goes to the blood, causing hyperkalemia. That's why when I have acidosis, it ends up with hyperkalemia. Conversely, if I have alkalosis, it goes with hypokalemia. Some students use the mnemonic alkalosis. Look at this, potassium loss. Alkalosis is associated with hypokalemia, potassium loss. Another important point, beta-2 agonists stimulate the sodium-potassium pump. Let's draw a sodium-potassium pump. Here's your lovely cell, and here's the pump. It pumps sodium to the outside, and it pumps potassium to the inside. So if I'm taking beta agonist, I am stimulating my sodium potassium ATPase pump big time, which pushes sodium to the outside and potassium to the inside. Potassium is more in the cell and less potassium is left in the blood, i.e. hypokalemia. A fact that can be exploited in using beta-2 agonist to treat 
hyperkalemia because beta 2 agonists will cause hypokalemia. Hyperthyroidism can have the same exact effect. It can lead to hypokalemia. If beta agonists cause hypokalemia, what do you think beta blockers do? The opposite, hyperkalemia, because they inhibit the sodium potassium ATPase. What else inhibited the sodium potassium ATPase pump? Digoxin which means it can lead to hyperkalemia. Next, Kahn syndrome, primary hyperaldosteronism. When aldosterone is high, it reabsorbs salt and water, but it secretes potassium and hydrogen. Therefore, if I have Kahn syndrome, I am excreting too much hydrogen, leading to metabolic alkalosis. I am excreting too much potassium, leading to hypokalemia. Whether hypernatremia will happen or not depends on the aldosterone escape phenomenon. It's not a given. What if I have the opposite? What if aldosterone is low? Then you get the opposite, hyperkalemia. So when aldosterone is high, potassium is low in the blood, and when aldosterone is low, potassium is high. So let's talk about some causes of hypokalemia. Maybe I have too much aldosterone, which wastes potassium in the urine, also in the stool and the sweat. Aldosterone really hates potassium. If acidosis causes hyperkalemia because of the shift, then alkalosis causes hypokalemia. Beta agonists stimulated the sodium potassium ATPase, hypokalemia. Insulin pushes potassium into the cell, leaving less potassium outside, hypokalemia. Any disease that increases cell production, like cancer, can lead to hypokalemia because the more cells you're building, the more potassium you'll need to put inside each cell, which leaves less potassium outside, hypokalemia. This can also happen during refeeding syndrome. Imagine that I was starving to death and then suddenly went to a buffet restaurant, ate tons of food, and then for the next day and the next day and the next day, kept eating and eating and eating like crazy. My body, who has been hungry for a while, will start making cells like crazy, cell division, which requires potassium. This intracellular shift of potassium leaves less potassium outside, which can lead to hypokalemia. More importantly, it leads to hypophosphatemia, because I need phosphate to make ATP. All of these cells that were hungry before are now fed. They are making ATP like crazy, consuming all the phosphate, ending up with hypophosphatemia. When aldosterone is high, potassium is low. So it follows that when aldosterone is low, potassium is high. If I am building up cells, I'm consuming potassium. But if I'm breaking down cells, I am dishing potassium out of the cell and into the blood. Because when the red blood cell ruptures, phew, potassium will leave the cell and go to the blood. Similarly, when the skeletal muscle ruptures or when tumor cells rupture, especially after chemotherapy. Acidosis causes hyperkalemia. Blood transfusion. Many blood products contain potassium. Many medications contain potassium as well. Sodium problems, CNS problems, but calcium problems equals cardiac problems. Whether I have hypokalemia or hyperkalemia, arrhythmia can happen and it shows up on the EKG. If you're getting started for hypokalemia, just memorize prominent U waves on EKG and for the hyperkalemia, memorize the peak T wave. But of course, there is way more than this. For instance, as my hyperkalemia gets worse and worse and worse, I go from peak T wave to white QRS, sine wave pattern, ventricular fibrillation, cardiac arrest, I can die because my heart stopped during diastole. But hypercalcemia can stop your heart during systole. It's all about arrhythmia and abnormal excitation. Abnormal excitation can happen to other muscles, not just the heart. Muscle weakness, paralysis, irritability. When potassium is too low in the blood, cells will start to sacrifice themselves to bring all of that potassium that was in to the outside which can lead to rhabdomyolysis. All of these medications can alter potassium balance. Let's focus on the first five. Beta agonists cause hypokalemia. Beta blockers, hyperkalemia. All the diuretics will waste potassium, except the only diuretic that's anti-aldosterone, because aldosterone hates potassium. But if I give a diuretic that hates aldosterone, then we will love potassium so much. Hyperkalemia can happen with potassium sparing diuretics such as aldosterone, a play renone triamterine, 
amyloride. Beta agonists cause hypokalemia, therefore beta blockers and digoxin, which inhibit the sodium potassium pump, cause hyperkalemia. When ACE inhibitors are given, aldosterone will not show up. Aldosterone hates potassium, but when there is less aldosterone, there is more potassium. Cortisol has weak mineralocorticoid activity. What if I give too much cortisol? Well, then the mineralocorticoid activity goes up. It's as if you're giving aldosterone, which hates potassium too much. Let's link this to pharmacology. Pharmacology tie number one. Look at this. Here is the normal sodium potassium ATPase, pumping sodium to the outside, potassium to the inside. Sodium will accumulate outside the cell. All of these positive sodiums will repel each other. Eventually, sodium enters. When something positive goes in the cell, something positive has to leave the cell. It's called calcium. And this is the sodium calcium exchanger, which is secondary active transport, secondary to primary active, dependent upon the sodium potassium ATPase. But what if I give digoxin or beta blockers? They inhibit the sodium potassium ATPase. And when this pump is toast, this pump is also toast. Calcium will not be able to leave, calcium will stay inside. This is how digoxin boosts cardiac contractility by increasing the calcium inside the cell. But when the first pump is trashed, potassium will never be able to enter. Potassium will remain outside, causing hyperkalemia. So both digoxin and beta blockers block the sodium potassium ATPase, therefore both of them lead to hyperkalemia. But as for the beta agonist like albuterol, it boosts the sodium potassium ATPase, which means more potassium going in, which means less potassium available in the blood. Beta agonists can lead to hypokalemia. That's why you can use beta agonists to treat hyperkalemia. And speaking of treating hyperkalemia, first order of business, protect the heart because hyperkalemia can lead to arrhythmia. How do I protect the heart? Stabilize the membrane. If you have watched my videos on nerve physiology, I've told you that calcium stabilizes membranes. When calcium is available, it interferes with sodium and sodium will not enter into the excitable tissue. When sodium is not entering, depolarization is not happening by sodium, so I'm stabilizing the membrane a little. Next, for hyperkalemia, give insulin because it pushes potassium into the cell. But don't forget to give glucose as well because insulin will also push glucose into the cell. If you give potassium without glucose, insulin will push glucose and potassium either way and the patient can develop hypoglycemia. That's why when you give insulin, give glucose with it. All diuretics can treat hyperkalemia except potassium sparing diuretics. Beta agonists, absolutely, because they stimulate the sodium potassium pump. Kyxalate is a potassium binding resin. It's a doofus that you take by mouth, it goes to your gut, it tells the potassium you're not being absorbed today. I am not letting you go. I'm binding you and together we're leaving through the stool. This is how you get rid of potassium, decreasing the risk of hyperkalemia. And when everything hits the fan, dialysis to remove potassium. Here is a lovely slide summarizing hypokalemia causes clinical signs and symptoms and treatment versus hyperkalemia. We just talked about the treatment for hyperkalemia. Calcium gluconate, insulin, diuretics, beta agonist, kyxalate, dialysis. How do I treat hypokalemia? If the patient lacks potassium, give the patient potassium. You can also give beta blockers because they inhibit the sodium potassium ATPase and cause hyperkalemia. We're done with potassium in the blood. Let's talk about potassium in the urine. What's the normal potassium in the urine? 25 to 100 milliequivalents per liter per day. Just like with chloride, there is more potassium in the urine than in the blood. I'm talking about the concentration, of course. Causes of hypercaluria, which is increased potassium in the urine, include alkalosis. Remember, alka loss, the kidney is losing potassium. Moreover, this alkalosis could be caused by Kahn's or Cushing, which excrete hydrogen, that's why you get alkalosis, and they excrete potassium. That's why there is more potassium in the urine. All the diuretics trash the potassium in the urine except potassium sparing diuretics like spironolactone. Chronic renal failure. A kidney has failed to reabsorb potassium, so my potassium is showing up in the urine. Type 1 and type 2 RTA are usually associated with hypokalemia because this potassium is leaving through the urine, but in type 4 it's usually hyperkalemia so you can put type 4 here as a cause of low urine potassium. Licorice, for some reason, is aldosterone-like. It acts and behaves like aldosterone, who hates potassium so much, 
by dumping that potassium in the distal and collecting ducts. During starvation, my cells are being broken down, which raises potassium in the blood and this potassium will eventually have to leave through the urine. And the following is one of the most important facts in medicine. Any cause of volume depletion, let's say diarrhea, vomiting, blood loss, you name it, will trigger aldosterone release to reabsorb salt and water and rescue us from the volume depletion. However, anytime aldosterone goes up, what's going to happen to potassium? Hypokalemia, because all of the potassium will leave in the urine. Next, causes of low potassium in the urine. What's the opposite of alkalosis? Acidosis. One of the causes of acidosis is Addison disease. One of the causes of acidosis is potassium sparing diuretics. Depending on the stage of the acute renal failure, you can have low potassium in the urine. Malnutrition, malabsorption. I am not eating potassium. I cannot absorb potassium. Or if I'm taking kayexalate, the potassium binding resin. The doofus guy who is a pain in the neck who's not going to leave potassium alone until both of them leave in the stool. Do you want to learn more about metabolic acidosis with high anion gap and normal anion gap? What is the anion gap? What's the osmolar gap? What is compensated versus decompensated? What is fully compensated versus partially compensated? What's the base excess, base deficit, etc.? Learn about all of these topics by downloading my acid base imbalance course at medicosisperfectsnetage.com. If you want to learn more about other electrolytes like phosphate, chloride, calcium, magnesium, sodium, download my electrolytes course. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe, hit the bell and click on the join button. You can support me here or here. Go to my website to download my courses. Be safe, stay happy, study hard. This is Medicosis Perfect Snails, where medicine makes perfect sense.